Good morning. Um, my name is Johnny. Um, I am one of the um, leaders at the church here, and it is great to see you here this morning. We are um, continuing on in our series this morning in the book of Genesis. So we are in this summer series looking at um, some of the stories of God's first people. Um, so the aim of this series is not that we would just gain some sort of um, guidance to live a life, but that we would be pointed to Jesus. You see, the kid's storybook, the Jesus storybook, puts it this way, that every story throughout Scripture whispers his name. And that is our prayer for you today as we come to this story and as we go through this series, we pray that you will see Jesus in each of these stories. Last week, we looked at the story of Hagar, and this morning we are going to look at the story of Isaac. But before we do that, I want us to cast our minds back two weeks ago. Can anyone remember? Possibly not. No offence, Lewis, wherever he is. But I'm just going to, as a way of summary, um, I'm going to just give us a 90-second recap of where we're at in the story. So two weeks ago, we looked at the life of Abraham. Um, and Genesis 12 is this turning point in the whole story of humanity. It sounds like a really big statement, doesn't it? It kind of sounds a little bit over the top, but it's where your story and it's where our story completely and utterly changes. We go from brokenness to hope, as Lewis puts it. We go from brokenness to redemption. You see, Genesis 1 and 2 was going so well. God had created the earth. It was perfect. He said it was very good. Enter humanity, Adam and Eve, called to work, called to expand the territories of the earth two chapters of goodness. It's like a beautiful garden. But if your garden is anything like our one, <laughs> weeds quickly come, they quickly grow. And that is exactly what happens. We see in chapter three, things start to go wrong. Adam and Eve completely fail to fulfill the mandate God has given them. They disobey the one rule that God has given them, and they find themselves no longer within the boundaries of God's presence, but cast out. They're separated from friendship with God. And from this point, the world spins out of control. We see brothers killing brothers. We see humanity trying to build a tower to knock God off his throne. See, simply put, chapters 1 to 11 is the downward spiral of humanity. It's a story of humanity moving towards sin. Humanity moving away from God. Humanity becoming enemies of God as sin entered the world. But it's in this moment where Lewis took us through the story of Abraham, a 99-year-old random sheep herder from Haran. And God makes him this promise in chapter 12. He says, if you go to this land that I'll show you, you've never been there before, but I'll take you there. It's going to be the land I'm going to give you. I'm going to give it to you and your ancestors, and I'm going to make you the father of the nations. So Abraham, along with his wife, so old in age, they leave everything behind. All the comfort, all the security that they had ever known, they choose to leave it and follow God. But there's a big problem in the story. Abraham is in his old age, is childless, and Sarah is at the age where she can no longer bear children. So how is the promise of Abraham that he's going to become the father of the nations, how is that supposed to happen without children? On chapter 17, we see Sarah and Abraham have unbelief. God says, we're going to give you a son, and their response is to laugh. But God reaffirms that promise, that Abraham, you will have a son, and your descendants will be a great nation. We pick the story up in chapter 17, verse 19, where it says this, your wife Sarah will bear you a son, and you will call him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. Fast forward a few chapters into chapter 21, it says this, Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age, at the very time God had promised him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to the son Sarah bore him. You see, the birth of Isaac was totally miraculous. I am no expert in biology, but I am told that this is a miraculous thing. It seemed impossible, absolutely impossible, but we know that God loves to do the miraculous. 
You see, Abraham was experiencing once again that God not only makes incredible promises, but he goes beyond that and he keeps incredible promises. Have you ever experienced that kind of joy when God breaks through and answers your prayer? This morning, there was great joy in our household because Lynn got a full night's sleep for the first time in about two months. Our son, Caleb, who will be two in August, has been struggling to sleep all night. And last night before we put him down, Lynn said, let's just pray. Let's pray and see what happens. So we prayed for Caleb to sleep. Now, if you're a parent, I'm sure you can identify with this. We woke up at four o'clock in the morning. We thought, what? It's no noise. Where is he? It was fine. He was still asleep. There was joy and relief in our household this morning as Caleb slept the whole night. If we had that joy and relief, can you imagine the joy and relief that Abraham and Sarah had in that moment? They had been told and promised that we are going to give you this son, Isaac. And they were waiting, waiting, and waiting. And finally, they're sat there holding their new baby boy in their arms. Isaac has entered the story. So if you have your Bible with you, turn to Genesis chapter 22. And I'm going to invite Joy. She's going to come up and read that to us. So it's Genesis chapter 22 verses 1 to 19. So if you were to go back and read the full account of the life of Abraham, you'll see that calling, that God's calling him is just part of the course for Abraham. It's a pretty normal thing. So when God shows up in verse 1 and says, Abraham, and he responds and says, here I am, Abraham has seen God do the impossible so many times that his default position and response is, I'll do it. God, what is it you want me to do? I will do it. If you've ever experienced God like that, if you've ever experienced God breaking through in prayer in miraculous ways, that's so often our response after, isn't it? God has done this, and he comes and he says, will you do something? You're like, yes, I'll do it. And that is like Abraham. Verse 2, God then makes this disturbing request of Abraham. It says this, then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love. If you notice the emphasis there, whom you love, he's talking about Isaac. And go to the region of Morah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Early in the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. I don't know about you, The whole story just makes me feel pretty uncomfortable. So we read this story and we hear the end and we we love it. But I think we need to ask ourselves really honestly, are we actually okay with what is going on here? Abraham has been asked to sacrifice his only son. The one he loves. The one he's been waiting for. Isn't that a bit severe? It's not a bit unfair. Couldn't you just say, sacrifice a coffee? Sounds pretty severe. Or is it that we're only okay with the story because we know the ending? We read through the end and we know that God spares Isaac in the last minute. He saves his life. But let's just step back for a moment. Let's put ourselves in Abraham's shoes in this story. You see, at the point in this story where Abraham is asked to sacrifice his son, he doesn't know the ending. It's an absolutely brutal request. But what does he do? He obeys God. Put it lightly, that is an uncomfortable thing to be asked to do. Like really, the God that we have just been singing about this morning Would he really ask someone to sacrifice his son? But here's the problem. When we read the Bible, so often we read the Bible with our context being in the 21st century. See, what we need to understand is that when we read the Bible, we need to step into the context to understand what is really going on here. You see, Abraham didn't grow up in Glasgow in 2023 enjoying all the nice coffee shops, all the nice parks. He grew up in a Canaanite worldview. And in this worldview, they had this God, and it was a God of fertility, who when they worshipped, 
would provide for them children. But on this occasion, the God, on the odd occasion, the God would demand a portion back. So human sacrifice was a common practice. And there's multiple ancient texts from that time that record children being sacrificed as a way to provide a certainty of future fertility. That may seem shocking to us, and it is. But for Abraham, this was a practice he was pretty familiar with. You see, to Abraham, this is just what the gods did. They would demand a sacrifice, so why would this god be any different? Did you notice after that request, he doesn't go and have a conversation with his wife? He doesn't pull Isaac in and says, oh, do you know, we need to have a little heart to heart. God's asked me to do this. What do you think? He doesn't do any of that. What does he do? He simply packs up his bags, he packs up everything he needs, and he goes. See, I can only imagine that he doesn't like the request, but he's not surprised by it. And hopefully that context helps us understand that his seeming ease to go and do this, despite what we look and despite how we look at it and, and think it might seem like quite a crazy request. Let's continue on to verse 4. It says, On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servant, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering, placed it on his own son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father? Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went off together. Now, I know this is quite an uncomfortable picture, but I just want us for a minute to place ourselves in this story. Can you imagine the emotion that Abraham and Isaac must have been going through? Let's just sit there for a minute. Could you imagine being Abraham or Isaac in this story? See, Abraham is displaying this incredible faith. He's following through with what God has told him, and despite there being hints of him believing that God will provide a way out, he's preparing as if he's going to have to follow through. Abraham is displaying incredible faith and total trust in God. Verse 9, when they reached the place God had told them, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and he took the knife to slay his son there was no hesitancy. There was no second thoughts. There was no questioning of God. He's just going through with what God has told him to do. But then the turning point comes in verse 11. The angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Can you imagine the relief when that happens? He says, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know you fear God because you've not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there was a thicket. He saw a ram caught by its thorn. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. See, in the last minute, just as Abraham was about to follow through with what God had told him to do, God intervenes and provides a substitute. Can you imagine the relief for Abraham in that moment? See, Abraham was totally willing to do it. He was full of obedience. He was full of faith, but God stopped him. He spared his son Isaac by providing this ram that was sacrificed in his place. The story then ends. And it ends with the same promise that it began with at the start. So it kind of leads us to ask the question, what is the point of this story? Why would God make such a disturbing request to a father? Think of the emotional and the psychological impact on both Abraham and Isaac. The preparation, the three-day journey, the act of placing his son on the altar. Yet God came through and saved Isaac's life. So what is the point of the story. Now, I think there's definitely an element of the story where God is showing Abraham and his people that his ways are different. 
He's not like the other gods. He doesn't demand a human sacrifice to appease him. But I also think there's something much deeper going on here too. See, as I was thinking about this story this week, I kept trying to put myself in Abraham's shoes. Imagining what it would have been like to receive that request from God, to load up the supplies, to to travel for three days. What sort of conversations would they have had on that journey? As they see the mountain getting closer and closer, would I have taken, started to be a bit hesitant? Would I have slowed my steps down purposely in the hope that actually something might change if I just slow this down? What about the moment that I placed my son on the altar? Do you imagine the look in his eyes? As I wrestled with that this week, I, I couldn't even begin to imagine what that was like. You see, the story builds and builds and builds, and I think it just gives us this incredible sense of uneasiness. It certainly did for me this week. Forget putting myself in my own shoes or in Abraham's shoes, but imagine being Abraham, willing to take his son and to sacrifice him. I couldn't do that. I could not do that. And I think that is the whole point of this story because it's in those emotions, it's in those moments that the whole story points us to Jesus. I think the whole point of the story is that it will disturb us, that it will unsettle us, and that as we start to feel that, we need to completely flip our perspectives. Most of, the week, most of this week I've spent being disturbed by how God asked Abraham to sacrifice his son, but I haven't really not thought this week about the fact that God did sacrifice his son. He did. He sacrificed his son. See, as we look at this story this morning, we missed one small yet important point, and that is this. We need to ask ourselves, where did this story actually take place? Verse 2, it says this, Then God said, Take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Morah. The story took place in Morah. And this was the place where Abraham offered Isaac, and it's now considered to be exactly the same site that the dome of the rock of the old city, Jerusalem, was sat on. Where exactly 2,000 years later, on the same mountain, on a dark night, God would provide his only son. The son whom he loved, Jesus. You see, Jesus willingly walked up that same mountain, carrying the wood on his own back, And there he was fastened to a vertical altar of sacrifice. But this time, nobody stepped in to stop the death. God followed through with it. He didn't stop the nails being drilled into his son's hands. He didn't stop the crown of thorns being placed on his head. He watched as insults were hurled at his son. He looked at him there with nails holding him to the cross, grasping for air, and he didn't intervene. You see, God let his son pay the price for our sin. And that is the part of this story that should disturb us. You see, God would not withhold his son for us. God spared Abraham from having to sacrifice Isaac, and instead he took the burden on himself. We read this text so often and we think, how on earth could a father do that? How on earth could a father take your son and put him on the altar? Do you know what? That's exactly what God did for us. He takes his son and he puts him on the altar in our place. The whole story of Abraham and Isaac, as we said right at the start of this, is a foreshadowing. It's a whisper of Jesus. It's a prophetic reenactment of the greater redemption of God and how he has accomplished that through Jesus. You see, the bottom line of this story is actually pretty simple. God provides a substitute. For Isaac and for Abraham, he provided a ram. He has sent his son the greater Isaac, 
to be the Lamb of God for us, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, as it says in John 1. You see, Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God. But did you notice Abraham was willing to do it, but God pulled him back? You don't have to do that, Abraham. I will pray, pay the price for you because I love you so much. I'll pay the price for you. I'll sacrifice so this relationship can continue. Did you know this morning, whether you are a Christian or whether you are not, that is exactly what God has done for you? He has sent his son to pay the price that we couldn't pay. He sent his son to pay the price and take the punishment that we deserve. See, the consequences of our sin and of our mistakes is death and eternal separation from God. But God says to you this morning, I love you too much to let you go through that. I love you too much to be separated from you for the rest of eternity, so I will take your place. The punishment that should have been on me, the punishment that should have been on you, God looks and he sends his son as a substitute. The innocent taking the place of the guilty. You see, that son, Jesus, the greater Isaac, would through death destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil. And he would plunder the keys of death and Hades to secure eternal life and victory to all who share Abraham's confession. The Lord provided himself both as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and also the Lion of the tribe of Judah who will rule the nations from that very ridge of shadowed sacrifice and promised provision. Alan Frow, one of the leaders of the advanced movement, the family of churches that we are privileged to belong to, sums up this passage so helpfully by saying this, God said to Abraham after he had placed Isaac on the sacrificial altar on the mountain, now I know you love me because you did not withhold your only son. This is ultimately how we know that God the Father loves us. He did not withhold his son from us. As Jesus goes on the cross, he dies the most brutal death takes the punishment that we, couldn't deserve, that we deserved. He's put in the tomb. And three days later, he raises from new life. The tomb is empty. And we have victory in him. He has defeated death. For all of us who know Jesus, for all of us who follow Jesus, we have new life and we have victory in him because Jesus was our substitute. You see, the cross became the new altar where the greatest sacrifice was made on our behalf. And we stand at the cross because of what he has done. You see, this morning we are going to take communion in a few minutes and we are going to remember and we are going to celebrate by joining in this meal because Jesus has made a way. Jesus has made a way. Andrew Wilson a theologian as part of the New Frontiers Network tweeted this this morning. I saw it on the way to church and just thought it was really helpful for us. We remember our sins and so often forget God's promises. But the good news this morning is that God remembers his promises. He is faithful to his promises. And more than that, he forgets our sin. So this morning, as we come to the table and as we have the bread and we have the cup, we need to remind ourselves, remember, he forgets. And he is faithful to his promises to forgive us. Let's spend some time praying.